Okay, one sec here. Perfect. All right, we're good to go. All right, welcome to the latest episode of the Big Hair Big Licks podcast. On the podcast today, I have the almighty, <laughs> the powerful, Matt. Matt right. Duff. Yes, sir, I am here. I'm, I go by many names. Besides that, I've gone by Zebo. I have gone by, I've gone by Darog. But tonight, I simply go as until the next time I do an interview, the ratings. <laughs> right on, That's the ratings. That's what we're doing tonight. That's what we're doing tonight. That. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have the, to see that you're doing the podcasting thing again. You know, it's funny. I was reaching out a little while ago. I, I put up a post on Facebook saying, does anybody do podcasts? Because I had done one with, um, I'm not sure if you know the Funky Moose guys. So Joel Godet and, and Mark Pop, and I did with done, did one with them a year nice, ago. Yeah. Those guys on Saskatchewan. And I yeah. was like, man, I wish I could do some more. And I put this up, like, does anybody do podcasts? And I was thinking, like, you know what? Man, let me delete this because I don't beg for nothing. I just take it. I don't ask for anything. I'm not put, you know, you know, whatever. Soon after that, you reach out to me. I'll start the podcast up. You want to do this? There you go. Hell yeah, manifestation. I love that attitude too. Like, I got a whole bunch of books about that over there on that shelf. I understand the concept well. It's, it's a very real thing. It really is. Um, well, I just want to say I really uh, appreciate you taking your time to do this today. Uh, so let's just kick right, uh, right into it here. I want to ask you um, – how did you get your start in music? Because you are a phenomenal drummer. Uh, is is your family musical? How did how did you get your start into uh, playing music? Well, here's the main thing, right? So, my parents are a consultant and a teacher. But my grandfather, Orville Dara, he was a renowned music teacher, pianist, scholar, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing is, I never really got to know him because he died before I was two. But my cousin Connor and I, my cousin Connor, if you don't know him, he's a pretty renowned jazz musician in the city. He's actually going to be releasing a, a, an album, a joint album pretty soon, which I did a couple of lyric videos for. So my belief, since we're talking about manifestation on the spiritual stuff, is that this, his musical talent and his abilities skipped a generation. They passed through the ether to us. But as far as what can I say for myself besides that, I would say around the year 2000 when I was just a waif. Um, if there was no really any big bang moment where it was like, I heard some song, I heard some album or anything and I'm like, this is what I want to do. It was just more something that was just innately there. Like I would just, I'm always pressure seeking. I need to release. So I'm just always doing this kind of stuff. Damn near everything that I do is just rhythmic, even down to the way that I speak, the way that I just go about a, a bunch of certain things. And my parents, my grandparents, well, my grandmother at the time, she was just noticing that. One of a sudden, this kid is just doing all these things rhythmically, just banging on the kitchen and the pots and pans, all this stuff. Get him a drum kit. They bought me a drum kit around the age of five. And that was basically it from that point. You know, started taking lessons until I just figured that I just wanted to, to really just do this myself. And, you know, it's not that I'm necessarily unteachable. It's more that I just felt that I was more productive in just doing this stuff and figuring it out on my own. Plus, with, like, YouTube, you can just... You can find anything you want to know, study anything you want to know. I'm not as good on sheet music. I'm more, I'm more of just like a, a visual audio learner anyway. So that's how I usually go about things. So that's about it. Well, that's fantastic. That's, that is super cool to hear that you've been playing since you were five. And I was actually going to ask you if you were related to Connor because uh, we did um, uh, the Alex D tribute years ago and Connor was playing, uh, playing mm -hmm. there and I met him, uh, such a nice person. Uh, uh, very cool to see that, to see that you guys are related there. Um, now growing up playing drums, uh, and, and I totally relate to that kind of, uh, teaching yourself at a certain point, uh, and, and just kind of finding your own style. What drummers influenced you growing up? Who, who are some of your heroes? <clears throat> It took me a while to really have any particular influences. I mean, it was just, okay, let me just go ahead and say this. I would say over the years, there's been a few. I picked up, picked up tips from Chris Auer. I picked up tips from Gene Hoagland or Joey Kramer or, or Bonzo, of course. I mean, there's a few. I've actually been, and I'll get into the details of this at a later date. I've been doing a lot of Rush and working with a lot of Rush recently. And a lot of that Neil Peart stuff, Neil Peart, excuse me, has been really rubbing off in that way. But man, dude. <laughs> It is quite a whole lot of work to, to really get all those little nuances and stuff down. I will say that. For sure. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, well, that is awesome. I definitely hear a lot of uh, 
a lot of those influences that you that you stated there in in your playing for sure but you've got your own style which is super cool so like as you started teaching yourself going through the years um learning and learning uh how did you start playing in bands uh We'll get into the bands that you play in right now, but uh, like, what were some of your first experiences with playing music live? Well, here's the funny thing, right? So, and this this is going to be very interesting. So, speaking of Connor, so let's say about high school. Well, actually, even before that, let's take it back to middle school. I auditioned a couple of times at River Heights School for for the jazz band. Well, once didn't get in. Kelvin Jazz Band, I did, and then I did again, and then the next year. I, I didn't. Well, they, they offered me the junior band instead of a senior band, but the guy who got the senior band was younger than me, which made no sense. So I just went off and did some other gig anyway. But around that time, so Connor, as I said, he's all into jazz. He went through the U of M jazz program. And every year they had the University of Manitoba jazz camp in late August. And so I went there for four years and then with Connor and I got ingratiated. I learned a lot through that, you know, just, just the clinics and other stuff that they would do. And and they got this at Park Alley's now on Tuesdays. It's probably happening right now as we speak. They had the Nicolino's Wednesday, Cool Wednesday Night Hang. You'd have the whole jazz faculty come down there. They would, like All the profs would do a set first, and then everybody would get up and jam. And that's where I really just cut my teeth learning that kind of stuff. I mean, I'd always done the rock and all that stuff before, but this is just more of an adventure to sophisticate my abilities just in the jazz realm. But then over time... Like I, I wasn't necessarily even a jazz really jazz reader. Like my cousin could read music, but there's a difference between people that are just by the book. It, it didn't really come natural to them. And they just really got to learn it that way. And people that are just, it's, it's just there. It's just inside you. And I think that's the case. Like I said, with, with Connor and I, and the prof certainly noticed that. And, you know, over a while, I just learned how to groove. I learned how to swing. I learned how to do all this, and, you know, just improvising and comping and just being in conversation with the rest of the instruments, which which helps a lot more. And for any musician who's looking to improve their chops, I would certainly recommend that, you know, going to something like that or at least going out of the park alleys, hang and doing all that. But, you know, well, in the midst of that, after one year with with Connor and with a, a couple other guys from from Calvin High School, which I was at. I formed my first band, which was actually a, like a jazz ensemble, jazz fusion. We called it Faz Fusion. We played, we played at the Kelvin Class Act. We did a we did a couple of we did um yeah we did a couple of gigs at coffee houses and stuff like that. We did one of the Vincent Massey coffee houses. A whole bunch of Kelvin people came through, and then all of a sudden <laughs> they just restricted it to Vincent Massey because you know it just no, it's only us. And then I took liberty to do three songs at a coffee house one time, and then all of a sudden there was a limit for two. So I'm responsible for a whole bunch of rules and it, uh, being implemented and shit like that. But, you know, back to the point. So that was my first thing that I did. And then my buddy John Seaburn, who I jammed with from Calvin High School, we were doing some stuff for a while. And then right around 2017, when I started transitioning from the jazz world into this little circle, this little scene that we got right now, you know, I started meeting everybody coming around. My next beat, my next bit was these guys right here. I put on an ad of Kijiji and I was just basically like, okay, here's, I. And speaking of manifestation, I wrote down like a whole list of stuff that I was looking to find in a band. I put this out there and then I put a Kijiji ad in. And when I came back and I started jamming with these guys, Twang Bomb that is, for those that don't know, I made these jerseys. <laughs> so... They really fit a lot of the qualifications of what I was looking for in a band. Or let me not even say qualifications because it looks like I'm demanding. No, I'm just it, just the the image of what I had, what I wanted in a band. It seemed to be really fitting, and you know we're we're still going strong since, and we're actually in the middle of. I haven't told this any, to anyone yet. We're in the middle of making our first album, which is, you know, we've been trying to do that for quite a while, and we're just now getting around to it. So that happened there, and then in 2019. I joined Ash and the Arsonists. I joined a cover band around the same time. And in just the other month in March, I joined something else. And I'm sure we'll get into that in just a second. You know what I'm talking about. A hundred percent. We were that's right. awesome. We'll we'll definitely get into uh into what you just mentioned there. And uh I appreciate you dropping that uh uh gonna be a lame joke here but that that bomb about the uh first record there that is awesome. Mm -hmm. I I love your post it's the year of the bomb. Uh, yeah. And let me just say one more thing. 
right around the turn of this last year, we almost quit. The two main guys, Jason Marlin, they were like, you know what, let's just do one more packing in, whatever, whatever. Matt Curry, who's our bassist and the guy who, and let me give a shout out to him, he's been producing and engineering the whole thing. We've just been doing this ourselves out of Chase's garage. You know, he convinced us into just giving it one more shot throughout the year, and then we just started doing a show a month and picking up and actually getting serious about doing a record. Sorry about that. And then all of a sudden, we were just like, you know what? It's the year of the bomb. I can't remember. I think I might have come up with the slogan or whatever, but anytime, any hashtag I can use, anything for social media, like, boom, just throw it out there, and this just became the mantra. I mean, are we going to do this? Yes, we are, because it's the year of the bomb, and that's the the attitude that we've had through the whole time, really. Hell yeah. I, I love that so much, and that's the perfect segue into the next thing I wanted to uh, to talk about. Um, we'll talk about the other thing you mentioned at the end there a little bit later. Um, but, uh, one thing I wanted to just kind of talk about, and this will segue into a uh, collabo season. Um, yeah. but man, the one thing I admire just as much as your drum, uh, drum skills and, and musicianship is your hustle and grind. Like you, I don't think I've really ever seen anybody, uh, hustle and grind at their craft and, and promoting and, and putting stuff out there like uh. you do, like. Uh, with the collabo season, any shows you've got, like you really put in the hard work and uh, mm. it, it's one of those things where I think, I, I don't think you can learn that. I think that's always in you. Yeah. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? Because I find a lot of musicians will have that, but then they'll kind of lose that over time. But you, you've the whole time I've known you, you've been consistent with it. Yeah, thank you. I mean, look, I've always... It's, it's a matter of determination and being sure of your presence and where you want to go. I've known what I wanted to do my whole life. And another thing is with a lot of musicians, okay, life gets in the way. You know, you have a job, you have kids, you already know about that. I can't say that, but you already know. But, you know, there's things that get in the way there and it, it sort of obstructs that or, you know, obstructs the direction that you might be going or it just sort of diverts your attention to other things that may be more prescient. But with me, it's just like, I'm determined. I'm focused and I know what I have to do to, you know, to go the distance. Like the one thing is, I don't know if you ever read this book right here for uh, how to make it in the new music business. Are you stand very valuable yeah. book for any musicians? You read that? Uh, I love all of Ari's stuff. Yeah. yeah. He's got a new edition coming out. But anyway, he said something in there. It's like when you're doing social media and all this stuff, you got to keep hitting them, hitting them, hitting them, hitting them, hitting them. Just like the album release. Okay. It used to be three or four years. You could just drop an album. Nope. You can't do that anymore. People's attention spans are too short. You just got to keep just dropping, 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 dropping. Excellent. Merit, one example, they've just been dropping little songs here, 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 sprinkling it out. And eventually out comes an album just like that. So that's the way I got to be doing it. I try to post something every day on the socials. I try to be wherever I can. You know, I'm not really much of an internet guy, really. I'm not, I don't really consider myself a content creator. I'm just, I'm on, I'm on the internet like this because I have to be as a musician and it's key to the promotion. And plus for the last couple of years, we didn't really have much of a choice, which, which just leads me into why, to how I got to do in the collabo season and all that type of stuff. But, you know, it's just consistently delivering and consistently improving your craft and just getting yourself out there and connecting and networking everywhere you can. I mean, with collabo season, I've already, I just worked with a guy from Spain i got a guy from Colombia that I work with, a couple guys from the United States, a few guys, but definitely a bunch of people here, and a couple other guys from other provinces across Canada. Well, Saskatchewan and British Columbia to be for sure, but, you know, I'm just going to keep expanding as much as I can, man. That's all I can say. That's that's fantastic. And, like, with the, with the collabo season stuff, like, <laughs> these covers are, like, so, like, excuse my language, fucking killer. Like, always <laughs> just crazy good. Uh, and I got to give a shout out to Brandon, uh, Brandon Howell, Howell um, unreal guitar player. Like I've, I've seen a lot of guitar players uh, and, and Brandon, just the way he plays is just unbelievable. But uh, just like everybody that you collaborate with is so good. And uh, it, I really love how like you're expanding to different parts of the world. Like you'll collaborate with people from the States or Spain, like you said, or um, it, how important is creating that network? Because we all know we have a really killer local scene here in Winnipeg, but mm -hmm. like you are, you're expanding outwards and, and, uh, bringing these connections back essentially to the local scene in a sense, 
uh, because who knows, maybe these people you collaborate with will come here or you'll go there. Uh, yeah. How important it is, it is it to you to create that connection and network? Well, it's very important. I mean, I can say with Brandon, he said to me in multiple conversations, and we got a bunch more in the tank, by the way, he said hundreds of people have asked him and expressed interest buzzing every time that, that we drop a collab with season episode. And they'll ask him, when's the next one? When's the next one? When's the next one? So we got that buzz happening down there. I'm definitely going to go down to West Virginia where he lives at, at some at some point soon. But it's very important to, to network across the world, especially with all the opportunities that we have to do so. You know, one comparison I will make, somebody that both you and I know, I'm not going to say their name, but they sort of compared – Compare me to Riley Saunders in a way. And I don't say this, this next thing that I'm going to say is any slight to Riley. He's fantastic at what he does. Riley is fantastic at bringing Winnipeg to Winnipeg. I'm fan. Well, well, okay, let me not be egotistical here. What I'm doing is I'm bringing Winnipeg to the world. So it's just like, you're bringing, okay, you're, you're giving all these other people exposure. Well, I'm reaching out and showing you all these, all these people from here, from this spot and that spot. You know, many people have just like you have said, like, okay, man, who's that guitar guy that you played with down in the states? Oh, the branding guy. Yeah, I mean, we got the buzz happening. Well, what was the last one we did? I got him playing with with Trevor Lux and them. I got him playing with Hog, and we're going to be doing another one with Hog pretty soon. So well, we got um got him playing with a, a couple other guys just with Brent recently, just the other yep. month, and yeah, I mean. Matter of time. I mean, I've I've talked to you about potentially getting something in whenever you have the time. Yeah, we could we could definitely make that happen. But yeah, just network as much as you can because it helps with your international reach. Because if like if I can create that much buzz just in West Virginia, just in, in one one little rural socket of the Ohio Valley, in two states over there, I can keep expanding and delivering. If I keep bringing these people back and delivering the buzz, and I got multiple places I can go. I got multiple people over the internet or whatever that I can show them. Okay, here's my album. Here's what I do. Check this out. Check what I got over here. You want CDs? I'll send you CDs. You want a distro kid link? You want a link page? Go to my go to the link in my bio. Here's what you do. And I'm just setting the groundwork for what's to come. It's not a matter of it's a matter of when. That's fantastic. I love that so much. Um, now uh, going back a little bit to the uh, the local scene there. Uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, about how important the local scene is to you? Like, I really love and appreciate uh, how, um, and and I'll just say outright, like ever since becoming a dad, it's been harder for me to get out to to shows and mm -hmm. stuff uh, naturally. Yeah. But uh, like, I notice that you're at every local show you can go to. Uh, you you support everybody. Um, how how important do you think the local scene is, and how like um, can you speak a little bit about how connected everybody is in the local scene? Because everybody knows everybody and uh, everybody's putting in hard work. It's really cool to see. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's always one degree of separation where I could go jam with some people. I'm like, oh, yeah, I jam with them. People are hang with them. People is, oh, you, you hang with them? Get out of here. I could go to a social. Oh, yeah. And other people that aren't even musical is about people I know from somewhere else. Oh, yeah, we were hanging. We knew this guy since birth. We, you know, we knew this guy from way back. So it just it just brings people together. And it's so crucial anywhere in your city, especially in a small town like this, because if we don't have the music, if we don't have each other, if we're not working and supporting each other, it dies. I'll give you another, I'll give you a comparison. Back in the day, the 1980s, you had all the hair metal bands, all those metal bands were coming off of the Sunset Strip. Okay, they all had the record deals, they had the industry, everything else was going on there. And they, and they were supportive of each other, it was what it was. But at the same time, up the coast, you had a scene percolating in Seattle. Who the hell was thinking of Seattle at that point? Grunge, all this stuff. All these people were just, you know, doing their own thing. They were just sort of alienated, sick of what was going on, musically, societally, other things of that sort. And they were a little, little tight-knit community. You know, and eventually, that hair metal stuff starts to wear off. And then the record, the record companies start picking those guys up. They had each other. You know, they support it. Support each other. You had institutions like Sub Pop Records. I compare something like Pipe and Hat or even Manitoba Music to that. Like they had that infrastructure that was there, albeit it was small, but it paid off once that started blowing up later on. So we, as a market that's sort of estranged from, I mean, it's ours to Toronto. That's where all the major labels are in Canada. 
It's ours even more to Los Angeles, to New York, to Nashville, if you're a country artist. Even, even more so because you're from Selkirk. You know what it's like. Just like, that's really small. You got the merch in maybe a couple other places for sure. So it's just a matter of, of, of solidarity and being able to do as much as you can, as much as you can afford to help the next man out. That's fantastic. I love that so much. Uh, now we'll uh, segue into, uh, if you want to talk a little bit about, about what you mentioned before there. Uh, so you played yeah. uh, Twang Bomb, uh, Ash and the Arsonist, uh, but there's something else you're playing in now. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how many of you remember the band On The Fly from way back in the day, the 2000s, maybe up till about 2015. It was Jamie Nenor and Marcel Greentree and, and a couple other people in there. But here's what happened. They've come back, and I'm the new drummer. And what happened was, I was just sitting back one day in early March. Jared Masters reached out, reaches out to me. You know Jared. He used to be in the blood shots, all that stuff. So yeah. I never met him a day in my life. Well, that's not entirely true. I'll get into that in a second. So he reaches out to me on Facebook. Hey, we're setting up this whole – we're setting up this little project. We're putting a band together. You want to come down? Okay. It's in Anoa. I'm like, great, another, another place out of town that I got to go to the jam. Okay, whatever. <laughs> so I go over there. To, to Jamie's property over there. And I'm expecting this to be like, you know, just some weak shit or something. Like, okay, and uh, whatever. Just, you know, no thank you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks, but I'll pass. But I go there, and dude has a serious setup in his shop. And we start jamming the tunes. I start listening to the tunes. We start jamming. And I'm like, shit, this is fucking for real. This is this, this legit. This is serious. This is the type of music I've been wanting to play. So I'm like, okay, let's go. And then they brought back Marcel after a couple of jams of it just being uh, Jamie and Jared and me, and that's and that's how it um that's how it coalesced. But just as far as the one degree of separation is the other thing I wanted to say about that. Well, actually, there's a second thing. Just let me say the first. So it's funny that I had mentioned to Jamie that I used that I was an Ashley Arson. He said Ashley Arson, fuck off, no way, you're playing with them. And then I recounted. See, I didn't realize he was an eternal now before. So yeah. back in 2019, when I first joined Ash and the Arsonist, I played my first show with them at a Manitoba music showcase at the Goodwill. Right, eternal, yeah, that's right. Yep, Eternal Now, they played that day too. I remember they were the best ones there. And so I had encountered them. I'd come across Jamie at that particular point. I didn't speak a word to him or anything, but I was we were in the same room. And then fast forward to last year. About this time, just about a year, like May, June, something like that, Ashley Arsonist, we do one of two Social Distortion tribute shows that we did. The other one was at the Pyramid in November. And so we do this one, and at both occasions, Bloodshots are doing their Nirvana tribute that they always do. Yeah. Jared Masters was still in the band. He was drumming that time. At the Goodwill, at the second, at the, sorry, excuse me, this first of the two tribute shows that we did, and again, it was at the Goodwill, and Jared was there. He was playing with them. Second time was with that band was with Ben Hodges at the Pyramid. But I had been in contact with two of these guys previously in the same place, and then it just came full circle like that. And I really had no idea. And it's just like, oh, okay. So <laughs> there you go, there you go. And and Jamie's like, oh yeah, I had Ronnie out here. We were jamming, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's just everything is just very connected. And here's the other thing I was going to say, and we'll make this a, maybe a joint announcement here. In case you missed it, mark this down in your calendars, everybody. July 21st, Bulldog Event Center, Twang Bomb, On the Fly, Ronnie Ladderbrook and the Electric. We are going to be playing there and rocking the fuck out, and it is going to be a great fucking time. Make sure you get your tickets right now. The event page will be up, I would assume, sometime next month or in July. I mean, it's a little early to be doing that yet, but... We're all going to be doing, well, Arsonist, Twain Bomb, uh, and On the Fly, we're going to be doing a little private show at, at Jamie's property next month. But the first public show, that's going to be it. And it was funny when I reached out to you and you're like, man, you're on the, in the fly, you're on, on the fly, that's wicked. Man, they were my favorite band. So hold on a second. I have to ask, are you are you guys playing steel? I said, yes, you are. You're like, fuck, yeah. Yeah. You're so goddamn hyped. Oh, yeah. man. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. That's Look out for track number four on the set list. That that thing is rocking. I'm going to play that extra hard for you, bud. 
Right on. I can't wait. Yeah, that's going to be a great show. Yeah, get your tickets. Uh, it's, that's fantastic. Uh, so we'll kind of uh, wind down the interview here. I've just got uh, uh, two questions left for you here. Uh, what are your upcoming plans? Uh, this can be for any of your projects. What, what do you got projected for the rest of the year? And then the last question is, what advice would you give to any young musicians coming up in the game? Okay, well, first off, what have I got projected for the first for the rest of the year? I can tell you what I got projected for this Friday, first of all. We're going to be at Bulldogs. Now, we're going to be at Bulldogs in July, but me, myself, Twang Bomb, and, and a couple others, Black Optic, Electric Boneyard, and Intersection X, we're going to be at Bulldog on Friday, May the 5th, playing a show on Friday night. So please get your tickets. I've promoted it all over the place. You can check any of my socials. I got links to the Eventbrite page and the event page on Facebook if you want to grab one. Or you can just get one at the door. Just DM me for any more details. So there's that. Like I said, we've got the Twang Bomb album, which is in the works. That is going to be coming at the end of the year. I intend to be running for... Oh, here's another announcement. Check this out. I intend to be running for Drummer of the Year, the Manitoba Loud Music Awards. I'm going to enter myself. I think the, the, the openings are are happening soon if not this month i'm definitely going to enter i encourage all of you to vote for me for sure and besides that ash the arsonist i don't know about eps or albums but i know that we definitely got another track coming out we've been working over there with with len from bedside and shout out to jim Unaz as well for the production assistance thank you very much so we got some other things we're going to be working on maybe working on some other people with some other tracks there and as far as on the fly we're just Oh, yeah, and Arsonist, we're just trying to figure out more shows and stuff like that. And Twang Bomb, we were sort of negotiating, talking with a talking with a couple other bands that you may know about doing this, doing that. I mean, nothing is confirmed, so I won't say anything as of yet. On the fly, we're just looking for shows and stuff that we can do and just definitely getting out there. And, you know, that's about it. And just keep keeping cranking out the collab season episodes as well. I got about six episodes right now that are just in the queue. I really need to get back to it. I haven't been prioritizing it as much because I've got all this live stuff going, but I've been trying to get one out a month for sure. One a month, one a month, one a month, one a month, just doing like that at the very least. You know, I used to go on marathons and just get tired after five or six. But anyway, there's all that happening for right sure. All right, something else I said, something else that we're going to say, but I kind of forgot. But let me just get to the last question then. So I would just say to anyone who's aspiring in a career in music, Whatever obstacles you may face, whatever comes your way, whoever doubts you, do not give up. Keep pushing. Keep being focused and following what you love, and you will find what you're looking for. If not that, you'll find what you're meant to be. Love that. Love that so much. All righty. Right on. Fantastic. Well, I really thank you for your time today, Matt. Uh, really great uh, to have you on the show here. Uh, I can't wait to play with you in July. Uh, I can't wait to see you play in the near future, and I can't wait for more collabo seasons. Absolutely. I mean, when, you, when we get free time, we'll see it if I can see if I can get you on one for sure. We got a lot planned coming up for sure. Hell yeah, right on. Thank you so much, and uh, you take care. Yep, you too. All right, peace out.